In this episode, mayoral candidate Travis Stovall and I came up with a couple of sketches. Real estate conversation. Let's go take a look at this. There's just a house that's floating. And then having to disappoint that person. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't think about that. Be on a date with somebody uh-huh. and not being able to tell what their CBI is. Oh, yeah. You're in the mayor's office and you've got just people coming in giving you random, like, crazy things that they're asking for. Which one did we pick? You'll find out on this episode of... It's a Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. Welcome back to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, where interesting people have intriguing conversations and then improvise a comedy sketch based on what was talked about. It is the only show like it on the internet. My name is Stuart Rice, and I'm the host of this crazy thing. You know, we get so caught up in the presidential election that sometimes we forget that the most important votes are the ones that affect us locally, such as who is going to be the next person to run the town or city you live in. During the COVID-19 pandemic, local leadership was crucial to help small businesses stay in business and your neighbors to be able to stay in their homes. Local initiatives have immediate effect on our lives. So we need to know who is going to lead us in the next huge, big issue that we get. Travis Stovall believes he is the guy for my hometown of Gresham, Oregon. He might be right. Travis is a scholar, founded a company that helps individuals and organizations find themselves, has been a board member of TriMet, and is one heck of a personable person. In fact, one of the most personable people you'll meet. His company, EREP, helps people find their core value index, which is what makes you you. And you can actually find out what that is by going to whatsmycvi.com. Links are in the show notes. And now, my conversation with Travis Stovall, 2020 mayoral candidate who knows how people tick. Travis, can I ask you a question real quick? Of course. All right. Absolutely. What makes you interesting? Just the sheer fact that uh, I'm Travis makes me interesting. (laughs) No, I mean, what makes me interesting? You know, for the most part, it's the unconventional way that I exist as a kind of as an African-American man. You know, people ask me what brought me to Oregon. I, I'm from Kansas originally. People ask me what it brought me to Oregon, and instantly I'm like, sleep is in Seattle. And they laugh. They're like, really? And I say, yeah, sleep is in Seattle. I was watching the movie. I hadn't been further west than Colorado. And it was Tom Hanks' character's floating house. I mean, this isn't a boathouse. This isn't a houseboat. It's a floating house. Yeah. I mean, it's a house that floats. And so I like, I got to go see this. And most people, when they, when they hear that, they say, well, you do know you're in Oregon, right? I'm like, I know I made a wrong turn. No, I, I went to Seattle, spent a year in Seattle, sure. fell in love with the Northwest, um, and then, then decided to move here. The interesting thing is when I moved here, I was a windsurfer and a snow skier. And people are like a little bit shocked because back in those days, uh, the, I mean, minorities who windsurfed and snow skied, were, it, it was just non-existent. Right. And so, you know, it's some of these things is this, this non I come from a, I grew up in an all black neighborhood, okay. um, went to all black schools in the inner city of Kansas City, uh, but yet made this unconventional move to doing things that were that traditionally and historically something that people like that look like me do. And so it's just right. always been interesting as I walk into situations and experience the facial expressions of folks as they look at me and they're like, um, but that's, I mean, that's kind of what makes me interesting. It's just that yeah, unconventional yeah. approach to life. Um, and so how did you get into windsurfing? Like, how does that happen? Yeah. That's, a, that's one, like, I am white and I've never been windsurfing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I worked at summer camp in Kansas. And most people are like, there's wind in Kansas? There actually is. Uh, Kansas has the has the fifth windiest lake in America. Down well, by we, know that, we know that... Wind tends Dorothy to go in circles, and right? like, uh, yeah. tornadoes and all that stuff. And so I worked at a summer camp uh, back in when I was younger, and we had windsurfers. And a buddy of mine was the wind first ins- windsurfer instructor. He said, "Travis, I am going to teach you how to windsurf." So I learned, and it's it's just a kick sport. I mean, I, 
I absolutely love winter. I don't do it much anymore just because it takes so much work to get to the gorge, get your board and right. all that stuff out. I just don't do it as much anymore. But do you own, a, uh, do you own I do not. No. I do no. not. That's a, that's definitely a rental for a it while. It is. It is. Well, I mean, and frankly, unless you're like living in Hood River, doing it a lot, it's right. pretty tricky to own a winter. It is kind of cool that we're so close. Absolutely. Because there are people that are not that close to Absolutely. Uh, sorry that I live so close to windsurfing and never windsurfed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am offending every windsurfer out there. Every windsurfer out there. Yeah. So you don't just windsurf and you don't just uh, do all that stuff. You are, uh, you do something called CVI. Yes. Explain, explain what CVI is. So the CVI is the Core Values Index Assessment, and it is a psychometric assessment tool. Psychometrics is, uh, you know, it sounds really fancy, but it's just a combination of psychology and math and algorithm. You combine those together to do what we call quantify the human psychology. I mean, that's what it is. And so the CBI is one of the most accurate assessments on the entire market ever produced. It has what we call a 97.7% repeat score reliability. I mean, you can take it multiple times over a longitudinal period. The result's going to be the same. That's incredible accuracy. So I can tell you how you are going to generally respond to different stimuli based on knowing your CBI profile. It's incredible. Yeah, I, it is pretty incredible. And I, you actually came and taught a, ta taught a class on it uh, to and a, and a thing I got to be a part of. And it was so eye-opening. I make everybody take this test now. Mm -hmm. I, have co I have new coworkers. First thing I do is say, hey, have you ever taken your CBI? Um, Absolutely. It's almost cultish <laughs> the way it's because <laughs> you convert it. Um, but the, the cool thing about it is that it, it uh, splits people off roughly. Like, this is very rough. It can get very granular, but really into four quadrants, right? That's correct. And uh, the four quadrants are... Uh, Merchant. Merchant, right. Builder. Builder. Innovator and banker. Innovator so and banker. Love is merchant. Builder is power. Innovator is wisdom. Banker is knowledge. So now, I don't fit into any of those. So what is that? I mean, you're, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Everybody fits into something. Some place, yeah. And, and, that's the, and that's the thing. It's this big picture aggregation of just how people operate. So, yeah. and like you said, it's it's four core value energies, which is considered a four quadrant assessment. Yeah. So, yep, yeah, it's a four Q, four quadrant assessment. And who, like, knowing this about somebody else, what does that do for your relationship with them? Oh, tremendous. It can tremendously improve our interpersonal relationships because now that I know your profile, I can better communicate with you, interact with you. And many times we assess others based on our own CVI profile because that's the way I see the world. So I see the world as a merchant builder, which I am. And so I'm going to evaluate and somewhat judge you through my lens, even though your profile may be dramatically different. And that's that's flawed because I need to in, I need to interact with you the way you want to be interacted with. And it would be great if the vice versa occurred and you interact with me. The way I want to be interacted. That's the platinum rule. Treat that's, others the way they want to be treated. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's the platinum rule. Yeah. yeah. Rather than the golden rule. Rather that's than the, the golden platinum rule. rule. Yes. And so, yeah, once we understand how someone's hardwired, we have a tremendous opportunity to then interact with that person the way they want to be interacted with. Without this information, we're, we're kind of shooting in the proverbial dark, trying to assess and understand this individual. And we're almost always going to revert back to how we are hardwired because that is what we know. So we are going to lead lead others. We're going to coach, teach, train. All of those things are going to be through our lens. And if I had children, I would want to produce little mini, little sure. mini me's yeah. because that is the profile that I have. So I'd want to build little merchant builders, regardless yeah. of what their profile is, if I don't know how they're hardwired. So I want I, you at home, if you're watching, uh, watch this reaction. So my daughter's an account, uh, the accountant. What is it? No, the banker. banker. My banker? daughter's a banker. Uh huh. Yeah. How would you handle that if you were a, if you were the parent and your daughter was a banker? I would trade her. I would trade her in. I would, I would, I'd be like, okay, can I can I trade this in on a different model? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's, but it is it, different. Like once I read it, when she took the test and we recognized it, I was like, oh man, that explains so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why Absolutely. So, and so I'm, I'm a merchant, and so the banker would be a core value energy for me. I'm a six. I'm a six banker because there's points that you get in each of the categories. 
I mean, since I don't really access the banker core value, that's a core value energy that is very difficult for me to understand and appreciate. So someone who's a high banker, I really don't know how they think. And so that would be, it would be work for me to truly appreciate their contribution to the world. And that's why I said, ah, ah, the banker. Right. I mean, I, I, I mean, now, of course, before the CBI, I didn't understand why bankers even existed. Sure. But now I absolutely understand their contribution to the world. And we want to leverage that contribution and embrace that contribution. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. So I, when I took it, I, I was a very high innovator. Which made me feel good because innovator is a good word, right? Like, yeah, it sounds yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for the innovator, uh, I don't think yeah, innovate would be good. Really, but, um, and what I found was in, in my working relationships, I work best with a builder, which is kind of the exact opposite. Again, it feels very opposite, but when I have a builder, builders are very much like, let's get this done. Like, let's right. go do it, do it. Do it. That's probably how you are. Which yep. will lead us to the next part of the conversation. But for me, I, I can sit there and like ponder an, an opportunity for a very long time with no action. Yes. And uh, when that when you said that in the class, I was like, oh, man, that's a problem. Like, I need to have some sort of building uh, aspect in my life. Um, and people can this test is free, right? So that we do have a free report. So the test is free to take. You'll get a basic report that shows them the primary and their secondary core value energies. But then there's an opportunity to upgrade and get the full report, all the numbers, a free PDF of the of the core values handbook, um, and that type of thing. But their initial information where they get their primary and their secondary determination is that's free. And that's cool, but like getting all the, the deep down info and really understanding that stuff, really what it did for me was it, it, it allowed me to recognize my weaknesses and what values I could actually bring to a, a situation, a team situation or anything. Absolutely. Now, the one thing that I would adjust is we don't, we don't actually consider weaknesses anymore because ultimately it's only a weakness if we're expected to access every single core value interview. So because I have six points of banker doesn't mean that I have a weakness. It just means that I don't access that energy. But essentially, I'm a merchant builder, and those are the two energies that I want to access, and I want to leverage some of my highest and best contribution. Right. But for folks who haven't taken the CBI and want to, what's my CBI.com? Uh, that's the place they can go. Take the CBI. It only takes about seven to nine minutes. So what's my CBI.com? Tremendous opportunity to understand exactly what you're talking about understand how folks are hardwired, how yeah. they are hardwired. And it, it is just awesome. I love it. I use it every day. I wrote a book on sales and they're hidden in there. I stole some concepts. <laughs> I'm just telling you that. I don't know if you're going to sue me now. but <laughs> yeah, Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are, you know, you're, you've got that merchant, so it's love, right? So you're, one of your core values is showing other people love and, and experiencing and uh, being person, a lot of times that is associated with being personable and being able to talk to people and those types of things. Uh, I, that's my experience with you as well. Correct. Um, now the builder aspect that means you're taking action. Right? Yes. Like that's a thing that you're going to do. You're taking a big action. You decided to to do something really big recently. What was that? So. I mean, and, and all the things that we're doing these days, trying to make positive change in the world, uh, an opportunity came up to actually run for mayor. Uh, mayor of Gresham, a town here in Oregon of uh, about 111,000 citizens. And uh, the opportunity came up and I was recommended uh, to run for mayor. And I, I spent some time really trying to take a look at it to make sure that I would have the opportunity to lean into this and decided, you know what, in this day and age and the many things that are going on from a social justice conversation through to fiscal responsibility, you wrap all of that up. And, you know, at the end of the day, I felt that I'm, re I'm, I'm really the best candidate to be able to lead our city forward through the myriad of things we need to step through. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's all about <laughs> taking action through that builder core value energy. Yeah. Um, so the idea of being mayor sound may sound good to people who've played SimCity. Uh, <laughs> what, what are your, your expectations when you walk into that? I, I don't know. Is it an office? It's an office. Do you, office. Get, do you get an office? There's, yeah. there's okay. an office. So you there's get an office. office. Yeah. You get to go in. First day you sit down. Like, what, what do you see yourself doing in that situation? 
I would panic. But what, uh, what would you do? Well, I mean, the beauty of of what we have access to in the city of Gresham is we've got a great staff and team. First and foremost, we've got a city manager. Now we're going through a process of hiring a new city manager currently right now, uh, but that city manager is really the person who's in charge of running the operations of the city. So a person who becomes mayor in the city of Gresham doesn't really have to have some significant knowledge, skills, in administration of a city. What they do need to bring is the ability to balance, you know, what needs to be balanced, the ability to connect with, with individuals, provide leadership and direction, and listen. I mean, those are some of the critical things that the mayor of Gresham should and needs to have in able to be able to lead the city forward. So, you know, your, your sense of, of, of being nervous about stepping into the role can be diminished when you understand the city structure okay. and know that you've got professionals who do the majority of things that need to be taken care of in a city, like regulations, processes, laws. All of those things are handled by consummate professionals who are hired by the city to execute on those things. Uh, the mayor and the council uh, primarily look at policy, approval of, of large contracts, ensuring that the, as we're, the, we're essentially the vector in which the citizens of our community get to work through. Uh, and so that's really what gr- it brings me the confidence to know. I used to, I mean, I'm on the TriMet board, which is our regional transportation uh, agency here in the Portland metro area. And we serve this about 2 million people. Um, we carry about 100 million rides annually, 300,000 rides per day when we're non-COVID. Um, and so that's a lot of movement, a lot of things that we have to deal with. We have everything from our own police force to, you know, to maintenance to, you name it. You know, it, it's encompassed within the TriMet universe. And so, I've had nine years of opportunity to really exist in a public role where all of our meetings are public, of course, and the discourse is public. So it's prepared me well uh, to be able to step into uh, the mayor role of the city. If the citizens of Gresham honor me with uh, electing me as mayor. Cool. Good answer. Um, so you're saying that the mayor is not like Batman. You're not doing everything. You've got you've got a lot of Alfreds around. Well, if it was like Batman, I couldn't tell you because then everybody would know I would be Batman. Good I mean, that's, that's yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is a risk. With that. Exactly. Yeah, more risk. like Spider-Man. Also, you know what? What, and what did Spider-Man's uncle say? With great power comes great, great responsibility. responsibility. I mean, there you go. There you so go. It's kind of more like Spider-Man. But yeah, if I if, if it was the role of Batman, yeah, I couldn't tell you because yeah. then you would know that I would be Batman. Right, right. Yeah, right, fair enough. Yep. I, what are the fringe benefits to being mayor? Do you get? Is there like you get like a, you go to restaurants in town and you're like, hey, and they're like, oh, we've got your table right over here. <laughs> Don't we wish? <laughs> no, it's. It's more like um, it's more like you go to the local grocery store and everybody's like, "Aren't you the mayor?" Yeah, and then they're requesting certain things. We need that stoplight on such and such a road. Mm-hmm. You know, wow, well, we're we're not cleaning the streets enough. That's more like uh, kind of being mayor of a town where you have an opportunity to be, you know, where folks can actually recognize you and also have access. So, the, and so I mean, the thing about uh, being a mayor in the public space is. Um, you have to appreciate and understand that not everybody is going to uh, is going to approve of all the decisions that need to be made at the city level. Uh, but the whole thing is about being fair and balanced, and you know, and that's been a hallmark of any type of leadership opportunities and responsibilities I've had in my lifetime. Is how do we bring fair and balanced approach to everything that we need to have discourse around? But yeah, I I don't think there's any mayor mayor's only parking, mayor's only seating. Yeah, none of that. That's no, a bummer. No. Well, <laughs> well, mayor's only podcast. Mayor's that. only podcast. Right. Got it. Um, what's a what? What are some? Uh, not, have you had interactions with previous mayors or other mayors, or uh, do, you, do you talk to dialogue with them? And yeah, them? actually, you know, I used to be the executive director for East Metro Economic Alliance, which is a combination of the four cities that we're we're sitting right now in Fairview. Um, so there's Fairview, there's City of Gresham, there's Stroudale, there's Wood Village. So all four of those mayors used to actually sit on my board at East Metro Economic Alliance. So I worked with all four of them historically as we dealt with economic advocacy here on the east side of Portland. 
uh, of the Waldemar County area. And so, yeah, no, I've I've worked very closely with many of the mayors that have existed here in East County over the years uh, to be able to move stuff forward in a way that's effective and appropriate. So. Yes, I've been able to work right, with a so, number of mayors. So, uh, do you guys like after these meetings or, or whatever? Do you like have the like go out for a drink, have a chat about what? What is the like? What are the things that mayors get hit with? I mean, besides like traffic lights, like what are the most ridiculous things that you've heard a mayor gets hit with? Well, I mean, one of the one of the funniest kind of things that uh, I, I know that uh, we had to deal with in, in Gresham. Uh, was the question of chickens in the backyard. Yes, chickens That's in the backyard. It was a serious <laughs> subject. Um, we had numerous council meetings to discuss chickens in the backyard. Um, I can tell you that in my many years of leading, uh, helping lead TriMet, that's a question that I never had to deal with. Chickens in the backyard. Nobody's asking if they can ride the Max. Well, we did chickens. have a llama. We did have a llama that rode on the Max one time. A true, a real llama uh, was on the Max. And what do you do in that situation? Do you yeah, just like I mean, let it happen and be like, all right, we got to put up a policy, no llamas? That's kind of what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no llamas. <laughs> Nero had no llamas. And, uh, we, I just I imagine, can, is that why I see the signs with the llama in the is, circle? And it is. And, and, and it's, you know, and sometimes, I mean, it is, it is fun to, to interact with the public in ways uh, that uh, we all have fun and enjoyment. But yeah, if we opened it up to one llama, we'd have to open up to oh, all yeah, llamas yeah. and alpacas and and then goats and horses. And as you could probably oh, imagine. Man. Before you know all before, the equine. The, yeah, the animals yeah. are in there. Uh, yeah, of course. I yeah, mean, they, we would be overrun with the animals on the max. That's so. right. And then they'll start demanding hay. You know, hay. Hmm. I don't know. Is that what alpacas <laughs> eat or llamas? I, I don't know. I think so. I think I, I'm. Um, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, I believe I'm not, so. You don't have to be an expert <laughs> not to be a, a mayor. I don't. No, think. I don't think you do. Um. So I, what? Are, what is? So let's speak about Gresham specifically because mm -hmm. this is the home of Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. No one cares about that, but I live here too. <laughs> um, and uh, what are the big, like, what, what's the big things for you? Like, what are you most excited about either improving, fixing, continuing, things of that nature? So, you know, there's a couple of things, of course. I mean, we've got to lean into the social justice conversation. You know, I was just uh, speaking with a police officer this morning uh, from another city, neighboring cities police force and just listening, just listening to some of the things. And even he said, he said, you know what? There are changes. There are improvements we need to make in our law enforcement. He goes, yeah, there are. There are some systemic, some systemic things that have been going on, systemic biases that we need to address. So I'm looking forward to leaning into that conversation for the betterment. You know, I don't believe in abolishing the police or defunding, but Based on, you know, kind of that conversation, what we've seen, yeah, we do have some improvements that we need to lean into. So I'm ex I'm excited about some of these social changes, social justice changes. Because I'm very excited about It's well overdue yeah. and long overdue. So uh, it, we're, in a, we're in a new space. It's it's just, it's it, it's invigorating that we are here where this conversation actually is getting its due airtime. Yeah. Know? So uh, so that's exciting. Um, frustrating that it's taking this long, but exciting that we now are on the cusp of I think real change. So that's uh, one thing. We we're, we're going to have some budget challenges based on COVID and the issues that uh, have arisen because of the COVID situation and the reduction in revenues. Our business income tax is going to come down. Various other things are going to be impacted, and so those are going to cause some challenges within our budget. How do we creatively adjust, address those? How do we do utilize civic engagement? to understand what's going to be the best path forward. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about ensuring that we are contacting and connecting with folks civically to get their thoughts and ideas. You know, I really want to continue to work hard on the economic development component. Uh, and what I say is equitable economic development. How do we make sure that economic development now is shared by all? So that everybody has an opportunity to start, grow, and prosper uh, in their own business if they want. Right. You know, how do we make sure we can tear down barriers, the historical barriers of why some folks could have access to business creation and economic development that others couldn't? And so how do we make sure those barriers no longer exist? Uh, you know, think about the store, the garage storefront program, which I which I believe has been very successful. You 
know, I know of a business that just a restaurant business that just launched or a food service business that just launched in the heart of COVID. So new businesses are, are really and small businesses are the lifeblood of our community. Ninety plus percent of business is small business. And so we have to encourage again, we have to encourage small businesses to start, grow, employ our folks. And then, you know, how do we how do we support that? So I'm excited about you know continuing some of these programs, but also finding other other additional ways to encourage this to happen within our community. Um, education is something that I'm truly passionate about. It, it generally falls outside of a city's purview. So the, our school districts in Oregon are state-based. Um, and so we, I mean, there's no direct control, but we, I mean, I would love to understand how the city and the school district can work together to achieve the outcomes that allow for better access, you know, more equitable access, and then, you know, really closing the achievement gap because the achievement gap still exists. Yeah. And we're, how do we close the achievement gap by truly equitable, you know, funding across, you know, across our school districts to ensure everybody's got that, that equitable opportunity. So those are some key things that, um, yeah, it's really you know, interesting I'm, I'm how much we have to talk about, um, creating actual equality mm -hmm. in this day and age. Yep. It's yeah. nutty to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as the social justice thing, do you feel like, um, do you feel like you're in a real, I feel like, I, personally, I feel like you are in a great position to be able to address this because I, unless I'm mistaken, you are African American. Yeah. I mean, okay, all right. some people wonder and then I have <laughs> well, to confirm the for them. I'm like, question. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I'm African American. Yes. So, I mean, I think that that actually, um, that actually is really important component that you can have these conversations with a police chief that maybe ten years ago that might have been a taboo subject. Correct. I think it's pretty Absolutely. spectacular. You can have that conversation, and they can speak frankly. Absolutely. That they, yeah, we do have issues. And yeah. Maybe it's time that we look at these things. And, well, um, and the key thing, Stuart, the key thing is is that as a black man in America, you know, you and I could argue all day long about whether or not systemic or systematic racism exists. I believe it does. I believe it does. So I'll say that. But you and I could just argue, not saying that you believe it doesn't. That's not the context. But right. we could argue about that all. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really interested in trying to convince you that it exists. But what I am, what I am more than happy to do is share with you my lived experience. And that's just my story, my lived experience and what I have experienced as a black man here in America to allow you to have a bit more understanding about how my life has been here. Um, and so I can bring that lived experience into uh, leadership to help others kind of say, you know, usually you get into situations where. It's there's a disconnect between what we're talking about and what someone has experienced. So the person's like, well, you know, it sounds kind of like it, but I, I, I know I saw it on television or I read it in the newspaper. But when someone you know expresses their just their lived experience, it's powerful. It's absolutely powerful when folks say, well, that that happened to you. And I'm like, yeah, it happened to me. It just becomes more real. And it opens up the door to a real conversation that you historically would not have been able to have. And I and I can I honestly say I think a lot of the stuff that's going on right now is, is causing the conversation to become way more in the forefront of, of what we're doing and what we're talking about on a daily basis than it ever has in my in my lifetime. It's the same. I don't know how old you are. I I assume we're roughly about the same age, but this is the first time that uh people have actually been more open mm -hmm. to talking about it. I mean, we just we just saw a football team change its name. Yes. Very controversial. Yep. I think it's the right move. I think Absolutely. it's those are the types of things we need to be doing. Absolutely. And I, I know this sounds odd, but I've got my own story along those lines. Obviously, it was not me specifically. It was <laughs> my very good, my best friend in high school. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to share one of those stories? Do you have a story that you can think of that... Absolutely. Um, you know, I recently, I, speaking of the sleep in Seattle, I recently <laughs> moved into a floating house. Oh, you did? I you, did. You bought I, the I, floating bought, house. I bought a floating house. And uh, this is here in Gresham. I, you know, just, you know, it's 
here in Gresham. And so people tend to think, well, no, our town doesn't suffer from anything like this. Well, I lived in my house for about three weeks and I was essentially walking to um, the the ramp to get ready to go up to the ramp because I'd just gotten done wor- working on my house with a couple of friends of mine who both were African Americans, and we were doing electrical work. They're electricians. Thank God you were not wearing hoodies. Oh uh, well, the the, the <laughs> store actually we weren't wearing hoodies, but still, we are all three of us. We walk into the edge of the ramp to get ready to go up. We're standing there talking, and a husband and wife come walking down the ramp. They walk right up to us, look at me, and say. What are you doing here? And at first, I'm, I, this is this is not even a year ago. So this isn't uh, this isn't 1975, 1979. This is 2019, and it caught me off guard. I'm because I just I I'd been in the community for about three weeks, and I thought people knew me. And he's, and so he looks us all three up and down and says, "Oh, you're working here." And I looked at him and I said, actually, I just bought a house here. Uh, I'm your new neighbor. Which then he was all fluffed, all just all flustered. Sure, about as he the should experience. be. <laughs> and, you know, just just recounting the story, just, you know, almost, you know, just wells up the emotion of, I can tell you, Stuart, no matter what I've accomplished, I graduated top of my class in, in college, summa cum laude, number one college graduate out of the business division to the degree. There's a plaque with my name on it at my college that I went to. I uh, went on to get my MBA, graduated with honors. I, you know, people say if you work hard, which I've done my entire life, you stay out of trouble, you'll get the respect you, you deserve. In that moment, nothing else mattered except for the color of my skin. He had no other way to evaluate whether I shouldn't have been there or I should have been there, but the color of my skin. Um, and that's, I mean, that's brutal at the end of the day. I yeah. mean, it's just exhausting and tiring to exist in a, in a country where we are constantly told and reminded that because of the color of our skin, we're going to evaluate you. We're going to judge you based on that external type of marker that exists. Nothing else. And so that's the that's the challenge. I mean, that's the challenge. There's been numerous stories, numerous stories of experiences that I've had. But that that was just recent. No, that one's. I mean, that was real that, that literally real. is just last year, to, later 2019. And it's just, I mean, it just it just crushes your 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 resolve when this happens so often. Did you uh, have you had dinner with them? Uh, not yet, but he he did say that he wants to have dinner with me. And, <laughs> That's the best. And hang yeah. out. Um, it's like I don't know if you ever saw Blazing Saddles. Oh but yeah, they bring the oh, apple yeah. pie, but at night. Oh yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, <laughs> I know the connotations. Yes. All right. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I think that those share stories all need to be shared because mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that look like me that think that all that stuff has gone away. It went away in the '60s. It didn't. No, no, it's still yeah. there. No. I am very much in here. Just to be clear, uh, in, institutionalized racism definitely exists, and I think it's getting those stories out is super important. So thank you for that, and thank you for your time going forward, because now it is time to record a sketch. Since the election is next week, it's probably too late to register, although please check your local state rules on that. Some of them are election day registration, so you can still get out there. However, if you have registered, please make sure to get out and vote. And hopefully, hearing about Travis and listening to the type of person that's probably running in your local market as well, you get to an idea of how dynamic and how great your local leadership can and hopefully will be. Travis, can you do me a favor and just give us a rundown of all of the different ways people can come and see and learn more about you and what you do? GreshamTogether.org. Uh, we're all about bringing Gresham together. We want we you know the mayor role in Gresham's nonpartisan, and so we're all about making sure that we can all work together to create a better future. Um, and so that's what we're passionate about. Uh, over on the CBI world, uh, we're at erep.com. So E-R-E-P.com. And again, if you want to take the CBI, it's what's my CBI.com. What's my Charlie Victor India.com. 
So those are the two places you can find us. Uh, if you want to reach us by email, just info at erep.com. Again, info at erep.com. Outstanding. And for all of you at home, please head to whatsmycvi.com and take that five-minute test. It is eye-opening. And now, our sketch. Pets to the max with Travis Stovall. In three, two. From the Max Stranger in Portland, Oregon, we're coming to you live for Channel 41. And today, we are actually here looking at how busy the Max trains are. There's a massive, looks like a massive movement of people that are traveling across the city. And we are shoulder to shoulder into the Max. So I am going to actually try and stay on the Max, see when the doors open and the doors close, how many people are getting on and off. So we have a clearer understanding. We, we believe that uh, TriMet needs to increase the number of trains that are going in and out of downtown because of how packed the Max trains truly are. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Yes, sir. Whoa. <laughs> what is that you have there? <laughs> Is um, I mean I don't quite know what kind of animal that is. It's a it's a pygmy goat. Ah, pygmy goat. It looks a little large to be a pygmy goat, but but frankly, I didn't know animals were allowed on the max. Well, they're they're people too, aren't they? Pygmy goats are <laughs> pygmy. Well, I'm not quite sure pygmy goats are are actually people. Well. It is to me. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Uh, even though the Max trains are incredibly full, we are now actually not just here. Well, I was getting ready to say we're not here with just people. But then again, to some people, pygmy goats are people, too. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse oh, me. Sorry, ma'am. <laughs> oh, excuse me, excuse me. And wow, uh, excuse me. Wow. It, and... We just had a pygmy goat come on, folks, and, and now we have yet another person who has joined us with another animal. Well, it's, it's actually about 12. Uh, these are all my chickens. I'm just taking them downtown for a nice walk in the park. So are we on Are we on TV right now? We, we are. We are. I am uh, Channel 41, and I'm news reporter Travis Stovall. I'm not we, familiar, but... Well, I'm actually incredibly famous uh, uh, here in the Portland metropolitan area. I'm a news reporter, so everybody knows who I am. Oh, okay. I'm investigative, but uh, today I'm just doing a little bit of uh, reporting on the Max and how full the Max is. And I see you act, you have actually just made the Max significantly full with uh, your 12 chickens. Yes, uh, I just need people to get up out of their seats and, and let my chickens sit. They need to sit. They might lay an egg. Just watch where you're stepping. Wow. Um, not only is the Max incredibly full, but we are still dealing with folks coming on with various forms of animals. Uh, and uh, 12 chickens, I am not quite sure with the number of folks that are sitting here if all those chickens are going to make it back off. Uh, excuse me. Oh, sir. <laughs> excuse me. I. <laughs> Whoa. Um, what, is, uh, what is that? This? Yeah. Yes, that. It's a, uh, it's a pygmy moose. I didn't know moose could be pygmy. They are still not very small when they're pygmy. <laughs> Just go ahead and sit down, Gertrude. Sit down. Are you sure that's a pygmy moose? Because that moose is pretty large. I, oh, I, I just try to make it uh, sound smaller by calling it a pygmy. I, I don't want people to think I'm taking up too much space in the max here. Got it, got it. Because to me, that moose looks very large. Sir, get, really your, not... get your hat off the face. Well, I think it's probably good, efficient use of the antler uh, if the person just puts their hat on there to hold it while we have a pygmy moose on the mat. Are you, are you taking pictures of the moose? Of course we are, sir, because uh, how often do we have a pygmy moose on mass train? Uh, just twice a week. Oh, tw oh, you ride it more than once. Wow. Well, folks, uh, like I said, we're, we're, we're going again, and the max train continues to get more and more full based on more and more people bringing their animals, their pygmy goats, their chickens, and now their pygmy moose. We've got just a couple more stops before we get to downtown and, and we step off, but we hope that we won't see too many more animals getting... Oh, wait. The pygmy goat is people, too. 
All right, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, wow, yeah. sir. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yeah. Don't, don't look at my jar. And what do you what do you what do you have in the jar? It's my don't tell anybody, it's my pet. And what kind of pet do you have? Have you heard of murder hornets? Thank you so much again for joining us at Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. Travis and I had a blast putting this together, and we hope you enjoyed it as well. Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is recorded under a Creative Commons, non-attribution, no derivatives, 4.0 international license, which probably means nothing to you, but it means the world to us and our words. If you would like to reproduce this in any way, please contact Sketch Comedy Podcast Show at gmail.com to request permission. I designed this show to be a voice for myself. This is how I get my voice out. Not everybody gets that choice. However, if you have registered to vote, you have a method to let your voice be heard. Please do not neglect. You've got one week left. Get out there. Get your voice heard by voting. Please go vote. Thank you so much. I'm excited about the next episode I'm going to be sharing with you. It's my chat with a world-dominating introvert. See you next episode.